is, is from Matthew 22, verses 15 to 22. Pay the imperial tax to Caesar. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity, that you teach the law of God in accordance with the truth. You are not swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Susan or not? But Jesus, knowing your evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the queen used for paying the tax. They brought him to the virus, and he asked them, Whose image is this? Is this? Excuse me. And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they heard him they were So they left him and went away. Another sacred text. This one from Octavia Butler. All that you touch, you change. All that you change changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. Thank you, Jerry. You also make a lovely assistant. In 2008, the late theologian Phyllis Tickle wrote these words in her book, The Great Emergence. She said that the church goes through a rummage sale every 500 years. It was her belief that we're currently living in and through one of those 500 year sales. Tickle's theory had merit, noting three distinct moments that fit her timetable. After the first century church came into existence under Roman persecution, another era emerged when Constantine converted to Christianity, ushering in a so-called golden age for the faith. But this age didn't last long because of the great schism that separated the churches theologically from the Western and the Eastern Orthodoxy. As time progressed, the Western church began to fracture as well. The reformers set in motion a fractured division within the Western church, creating variety of expressions in their own way, entrenched in a biblical worldview. We are a product of that. But what happens when we continue to grow and we evolve spiritually, emotionally, theologically, empathically, as we continue to change, and we realize that our guideposts have become caste systems. According to Tickle, we now stand at the threshold of another hinge moment within history, another point of transition. But transition isn't punctiliar, is it? It's sometimes a series of micro events, sometimes a series of micro decisions, and yet, Tickle says, every 500 years, the empowered structures of institutionalized Christianity, wherever they may be, whatever they may be, become an intolerable carapace that must be shattered so that renewal and growth will occur. She says, now is such a time. Intolerable intolerable. One author says, intolerable means the pain of staying here is greater than the risk of going there. The pain of staying here is greater than the risk of going there. And in Matthew 22, Jesus is in transition also. We've talked about how this is Holy Week. He's headed towards the crucifixion. And the religious powers that be are now starting to, to coalesce. In this passage, we see the Herodians have joined. It's not just the Pharisees. The tensions are high. Everyone is on edge. And they come to him with this question, do we pay taxes or not? 
As Jews, do we pay taxes to Caesar? We're being occupied by a Roman authority. Do we have to pay taxes to them? This is a political question being posed by religious people. Roman occupation is intolerable, but so is the religious power structure. But this is not a conversation about taxes. This is a conversation about belonging and about citizenry. The interaction with Jesus and the religious leaders is not rummage sale climate. They're trying to start a fight between Jesus and the Roman government over his authority because he's a threat to the religious status quo. He's a, he's a threat to what some people say, WWAD, what we've always done. And the truth is your views on taxation in Jesus' day could get you killed. Prior to Jesus' ministry, a rebel named Judas led an anti-taxation revolt in which the Romans crushed that revolt by pinning Judas and his cohorts to crosses. If Jesus answers no, he's a dangerous political threat. If he answers yes, he's in cahoots with the oppressive power. But this is not a conversation about taxes. It's about belonging and citizenry. The religious and political leaders say that belonging means behaving, that citizenry equals your salvation. But Jesus' teaching and life challenge those definitions because the people are living in transition. They are living in the midst of a transitive time. They're praying for transition, praying for change, living in intolerable power systems, longing for liberation, for hope, protection. It's like living in a system where you can't do enough to belong, where you can't do enough to earn favor. Are you with me? Transitions are not always comfortable. Transitions are not always easy, even when you want them. Transitions may bring forth things we didn't expect or things we don't want to deal with. And the practice for spiritual people is to remain steady in that midst of shifts. By the way, I think it's interesting that when Tickle describes this trans transition, she uses the analogy of a rummage sale and a shattering. Because for some of us, it will be like a rummage sale, treasures we have found. And for some of us, it will be a shattering. And sometimes it's both. In Matthew 22 and verses 18 to 20, this is not a conversation about taxes. And yet Jesus says, bring me a coin. Whose image, whose inscription do you see, he says. And I don't have time to tell you the ramifications in Roman culture for, for even putting an image of Caesar on a coin, because that act in and of itself was controversial within the Roman Empire. And yet the religious, religious leaders know the right answer right away. They say, we see Caesar's image. So Jesus says, so give back to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what, what is God's. Currency itself is neutral in this story. It's neither good nor bad. It's neither righteous or unrighteous, evil or positive. It's simply a tool and a mechanism of meeting needs and desires by facilitating exchange. The existence of this coin in and of itself is not problematic. It's the attachment of that particular coin to Caesar and to his imperial systems. And God doesn't function function under Caesar's systems. Jesus makes the claim that God's system, the kingdom, is distinct in character, nature, and participation. Jesus isn't concerned with the question of paying taxes because that's not God's system. Jesus is entirely concerned with the participation of God's people in God's system. I don't care if you pay taxes or not. Are you doing the will of God? Are you living in harmony? Are you striving for harmony? Are you seeking justice and peace? Pay whatever taxes you want. And there are power structures in transition that are shattering. 
The religious leaders want to trap Jesus into their box because they have also placed themselves in that box with empire. The benefits they receive come at a cost, part of which is an obligation to uphold the empire. No matter who they claim to worship, empire has become their god. And Jesus forces them to confront this truth. His disregard and courage in the face of imperial power simultaneously enrages and confounds them. And this has been evident throughout his entire discourse with them. And the response brings the truth of their real allegiance back to the forefront, because this is not a conversation about taxes. It's about belonging and citizenry. And who do you belong to? It's the same courage that 300, more than 300 of our Jewish siblings had this week when they showed up to Capitol Hill, when they showed up in Novato to protest the actions of the Israeli government demanding a ceasefire, demanding that their government stop its assault on Gaza. It's the courage of a rabbi, rabbi colleague of mine who just this Shabbos retold the story of Noah and the ark. You may remember the story. God decides in the Hebrew scriptures to destroy the earth by flood. And after the flood, God sends a rainbow and says, I'm never going to do that again. That was awful. And the rabbi preached to her congregation. She said, if God can change their mind, can't we? That's courage. This is not a conversation about taxes. It's about the transitioning definition of belonging and citizenry. Two, some, two words that meant something very different 100 years ago, 40 years ago, even 10, 20 years ago, and today. So what does it mean to belong? It means you feel connected. It means you feel seen and understood and welcomed. But what does it mean to be a citizen? This is a bit more complex because now we're aware of our capacity to be global citizens, not just nationalists. And yet we are in a season of transition in so many ways, culturally, theologically, politically, nationally, and as a church. And I wonder if our own structures have become intolerable. See, belonging and citizenry, like in Jesus' day, belonging and citizenry can determine your safety, your security. And those in power often fear losing that power because they believe they'll be treated the same way they've treated the people they've oppressed. Some of you remember the fear that some white soldiers had serving along soldiers, alongside soldiers of color. And I've heard more stories than I can recount of those same soldiers coming back from war, having their minds changed and realizing race is not an issue. But this is my brother who would die for me in the trench. And if that was true over there, why should it be any less true here? But oppressive power systems always thrive when we demonize each other. The author and social activist Naomi Klein told protesters this week gathered in Washington's National Mall that Israel was attempting genocide by making use of the Jewish fears of another genocide against Jews. She added, we will not let our fears of anti-Semitism be manipulated in this way. But when power structures feel threatened, their attacks become more sharp. Their attacks intensify. And we do that too, don't we? We dig our heels in, we come rigid, we close off because transitions make us feel unsteady. They make us feel protective and sometimes even suspicious. If you feel resistant to transition, notice it. Be compassionate with yourself because we're in transition too, church. We are in transition right here. And for you, maybe it feels like a rummage sale. Maybe it feels like a shattering. Maybe it feels like both. The teams and systems, the organizing we've used no longer fits us, CCC. 
we are in transition. And transitions always take time. But what if you feel like we're running out of time? Jesus is not fearful of his timetable. And I would say that neither should we be. One of my favorite quotes from the late prophet Rachel Held Evans said, people of the resurrection don't have to fear death. Because we know the stories of the gardener. Death always brings new life. The transition always brings rebirth. So we have no need to fear that. Your life is leaving a footprint of justice here in Tiburon, here in Marin. You can be confident to do, to hold that truth. When I was still candidating for this position, I remember calling the Reverend Davina Jones, who will be uh, confirmed in a few weeks as conference minister of the Northern California um, yeah, conference here of the United Church of Christ. And I remember speaking with Reverend Davina and I said, tell me about CCC Tiburon. I've talked to the previous pastors. I've heard stories. I've called their references. But I want to hear from you as the conference minister. And she said, there is still ministry to be done in Tiburon. There's still ministry to be done in Tiburon. There's still hearts to be changed. There's still justice to be found. And those words moved me. Those words encouraged me. And yet Jesus says, whose image do you see? Isn't everything God's? Don't we, do we have to give everything to God or nothing to God? What is it? I love the phrase Jesus uses in this passage. He says, whose image do you see? Boy, I got to tell you, that hit me right in my heart this week. It was so annoying. I was so annoyed this week. I was watching a service online, and this person who's just been uh, was right center front in there. And this line came to me while I was watching that service. Whose image do you see? Jesus puts the responsibility back on the people who are questioning him. I'm not going to answer this for you. For you, whose image do you see? When you look at your sibling, at your rival, at your enemy, maybe the transition we need is in our own vision of each other. Even as I was typing my notes for this sermon, I, the word program wanted to correct, rehumanize, to dehumanize. Even the program wanted to, ch wanted to change the word. I'm trying to transition my language. I want to rehumanize people. And it's like, nope, the word is dehumanized, Pastor. I said, no, it's rehumanized. So I started this practice with this phrase that Jesus says, whose image do you see? And I've already told you, it's been an adjustment driving in, in Mill Valley. And I have to tell you on one particular day, I was driving and, and I was cut off. And my first response was, blah, 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 you know, get all fired up. And then I looked at the license plate of the person who cut me off and I started to laugh. And I, I'm 99% sure it's nobody here from CCC, but if it is, you come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> the license plate said Quan Yin. Quan Yin. Quan Yin is the feminine version of Buddha energy. <laughs> so I started laughing because I said, I just got cut off by Quan Yin. <laughs> What in the blanket? You know, I told that story to first service. Someone said, well, when, it, when that happens, I just like to think, well, maybe they need to go to the bathroom. Maybe they, they're on a hurry to get somewhere. I said, well, maybe the, she was going to meditation. It doesn't always work to reframe. It doesn't always work to help reframe your mind because transition takes time. It takes time to rehumanize people because it's always happening around us always happening around us. And church, you've already transitioned in so many ways. You have. As a church, you've done things like adding solar panels. You've removed trees. 
You've created a labyrinth space. You've even added hearing devices, which we'll talk about another time. Don't worry, you didn't hear that. Personally, you've transitioned transition too. Colonoscopies are, are commonplace now. Thinning hair, cancers, transitional care. You're in transition too. When will you stop transitioning? Never. Not even after death. My wife describes this experience of transition as the sand dial. You know the sand dial? There's a top part where all the sand rests, right? And then there's the skinny little neck and then the bottom where everything comes to a nice soft landing. She says, sometimes transition, we feel like we're at top and, we're, and we don't know what's happening. <laughs> we haven't been sucked down into it. And we think everything, oh, there, no, there's no transition. Everything's great. But at some point you get to the little skinny part in the neck. And everything starts to feel real squishy. And you can't really see what's happening sometimes. And maybe you feel unsteady because the people that were around you aren't there anymore or the things that comforted you aren't there anymore. And you don't know where this is headed. And she says, but if you just trust, just trust that spirit, the time is gonna bring you to a soft landing. Where are you in that process today? Where are those who are closest to you, your loved ones? Are you feeling the pain, the squishiness, the darkness, the uncertainty? Maybe you've made it through. Maybe you can see the other side and it's your turn to encourage people now. But I want to leave you with that question, whose image do you see? Whose image are you focusing on? What needs to change so that you can see your siblings rather than adversaries? Transitions are happening right now, church. May they carry us to a soft, bright, beautiful space where justice for all prevails. May we have the courage we need, the solidarity to press together, even when things feel like they are shattering to press together and may peace prevail. Amen.